much for your very, very generous introduction and kind words, Richard. Uh, Richard DeBarra has been a leader on all the issues he talked about for such a while. Before Richard took over here, though, I worked for many years with Sam Luis, uh, and uh, I wanted to acknowledge his leadership as well. Richard is the executive director of Mission Neighborhood Center. Uh, every day, sees to the needs uh, of the children, of early education, Head Start, and again, uh, we just were together at the Latino Community Roundtable. So I see this sign for the children, and the drawing is Mission Bay Children. I love that because when people have asked me for the past 34 years, what are the most important issues facing the Congress, I always have said the same thing. Our children, our children, our children. Their health, their education, the economic security of their families, including the pension security of their senior uh, grandparents, as well as a safe, clean environment in which they can thrive, a world at peace in which they can reach their fulfillment. Uh, the Mission Neighborhood Center is dedicated to our children, our children, our children, and their families. I want to also acknowledge a special guest who is with us, Maria Andres, a, a survivor advocate and member of Parent Voices, balancing supporting her child, Eduardo, while working on jobs. Again, Maria has been with us on other Zooms when we've had days of action for the children and child care. Today, we're talking about a broader issue of care, and this is today is the care economy week of action. Not day, week of action. And the care includes another guest, Julie Fisher, and this is about the, uh, the, the home care issue on which we have $400 billion in the President's initiative. $400 billion for home care workers. We're going to talk about that. But Julie is. Is Lester with you? Lester, thank you. Where's Lester? Thank you for being with us. Yes, Lester. Thank you, Lester, for being with us as we talk about this important issue, $400 billion. So let's just say where we are. The care economy is the backbone of the U.S. economy. One of the debates that we're having in this discussion on infrastructure in the Congress is what is infrastructure? If we wed ourselves to an old idea of infrastructure, infrastructures of the 1950s, we will not be building back better. We will build back better when we recognize the human infrastructure part of this, that it involves education and training for more people to qualify for the jobs. If it recognizes that people have to be, have the freedom to go to work the big investment in child care, and the, the recognition of the talent of the people who will care for our children and care for those who need help, whether it is of a disability or seen, being seniors or whatever it is. So it is a respect. It's not only really a recognition of the need for people to be able to be free to go to work because their loved ones are cared for. It's respect for those who are caring for them in terms of their uh, the training, the support that they have, the ability for them to unionize, which is something that we have been working on uh, for a while in that regard. And we would hope that as California can be a model to the rest of the country in that regard. In our rescue plan, the one we just passed that um, was referenced by Mr. we have $45 billion for child care. That was largely related to COVID related to COVID, but we had to go well beyond that. Now, I see that we have some other guests here as I look around, and I see uh, parent voices, a parent, uh, it's a parent led group, uh, fighting for quality for the child care. Now, for years, I've been quoting them for years, parents earning, children learning, parents earning. And that has been so much in my life connection on the success of our children tied to the success of our economy. Uh, SEI Local 215, representing California's long-term care workers, is here. Thank you for being here. We want everybody to be 
Noonan and I just across the country. And then um, Sasha Bittner. Oh, my darling Sasha. I love her so much. She, she's the chair of the Regional Advisory Committee of State Council for Devel Developmental Disabilities and very much a teacher to the rest of us about how public policy affects the well-being of all of us. And, of course, this home care, $400 billion is about seniors and people uh, with disabilities. And I see Linda Asato here, the Executive Director of California Child Services Resource and Referral Network, again, about child care, research, education, and policy advocacy. This is about a new, a, a big day for us because we have a president whose budget is a statement of values of our country. That's what a federal budget is supposed to be, a statement of our country's values. And his budget is just that the value that we place on family, the recognition uh, that the people who do the caring need the respect, the pay, the training, uh, and the opportunity to, uh, to bargain collectively uh, as we go along. And so we're going to hear from uh, some of our guests, but I just want to brag a little bit about the rescue plan. It also secured a billion dollars for help Head Start, helping a Mission Neighborhood Center and other pillars of the community to um, have additional funding for the Head Start aspects of their problem. Expanded Lifeline on the tax, child tax credit to provide $10 billion to provide access to home uh, and community-based services during the pandemic for seniors and people living uh, with disabilities. Now again, much of that was rescue. When we go next to recovery and the job plan that is ahead, there'll be many, much more money because it will cover a longer period of time. Now we have a once in a century opportunity to fundamentally fix our broken care system. It has lots of love, it has lots of goodwill, it doesn't have all the funding and the recognition of that it needs, and it will because of the Democratic Congress, Social Senate, and uh, well, we would hope that this would all be bipartisan. It is in the country. Across the country, people support this in high numbers. Democrats, Republicans, Independents, whatever. But in the, Senate, in the Congress, we didn't get one vote for the rescue plan that did so many of the things that we have talked about. So again, I, I could go over the numbers again and again. Um, this, is, this is not a luxury we're talking about. This is a necessity. Pre-pandemic child care in California ranked among the least affordable in the nation, and now uh, rebuilding the cares, uh, now that's going to change. Some of what the governor is putting in the budget is money that comes uh, from all of this. So again, it goes on and on, lowers child care costs. When we talk about $200 billion, this is what it means to you. What it means to you is it ensures that no family pays more than 7% of income on child care. Invest in child care learning work, and training the workers important. Expands access to and the Head Start issue, places like Mission Neighborhood Center. And then this is another important part of it. Secures universal free preschool for three and four year olds. Now San Francisco has been in the lead in the nation by having preschool for four year olds, four year, universal four years in a row. This will enable them to come down to three year olds. Very, very important. And this is one of the things that we've been fighting for for so long. It has national paid family and medical leave with 12 weeks of leave. 12 weeks of leave. Now, San Francisco, again, in the lead, has eight weeks of leave. This will enable it to go uh, to 12. Expands tax credits, including the child tax credit, very important that we've fought for, dependent care tax credits. And then again, I mentioned the $400 billion uh, to expand access to home and community-based services for seniors and people living with disabilities while strengthening the home care workforce. We can always talk about this about what they do, but, uh, but also, okay, so it will, um, California has sort of taken the lead. We want the rest of the country to establish authorities where these workers can have uh, a, a place to make their case 
uh, for how we go forward. So in any event, um, the, uh, this jobs plan right now, excuse me, will be, it's, it has two manifestations. One is the jobs plan, which will have $25 billion over and above the 50-some billion we already have put in related to COVID to get us through the next period until we come. the next bill will have at least, I mean, the Women's Caucus in Congress would, wants to put like an infinite price tag on child care. Uh, the, the needs are infinite, but nonetheless, a, a couple hundred uh, billion dollars. It will ensure families are not forced to choose between taking care of a loved one or providing for their family in a way that gives them confidence that they can be where they are doing their work, knowing their children or their loved one is well cared for. So it's about family. Uh, there is a, a, a quote from Warren Buffett said, uh, I think it's useful, the closer that America comes to fully employing the talents of all women citizens, the greater its output will be. So you could make a pragmatic economic argument for all of this. We're speaking from a value standpoint of our responsibilities uh, to one another. And so we consider it, yes, it's important economically, but we consider it a health and moral Impar imperative. So that's what you will see in the weeks ahead uh, as we go forward. And we're going to hear, again, this is all important in terms of policy, but what it means personally to people is what our purpose is. All of this is for the people, for the children. And with that, I have a great appreciation, Mission Nation for Neighborhood Center, for the beautiful respect you will pay to the people children and families who come here by having such a beautiful, special venue for them. So when they come here, they will feel the love, feel the respect, and thrive, uh, and, and thrive in the atmosphere. With that, I, an appreciation and respect for all that is happening here. I'm pleased to yield back to Richard Ibarra. Thank you with great thanks. Is that a terrific report to the nation? Yes. I didn't hear it. Woo! 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 Moving on here, 14 years ago, a lawyer from Nicaragua moved here to continue her education. This parent and single mother, who recently earned a paralegal certificate at City College of San Francisco, has lived here for the last six years, owns Antonieta Legal Services, serving people with translations, bankruptcy, immigration, and more. When the pandemic slowed her business, Maria took on two part-time jobs as an organizer for the Housing Rights Committee and as a promotora for Mission Economic Development Agency, providing informational campaigns to San Francisco's Latinx community on available resources. I would like to introduce parent, organizer, and promotora, and her son, Eduardo Antonio Corona, Maria Antonieta Andres. Bankruptcy, immigration, paperwork. 
I also work two part two part time roles. One as a Southeast organizer for the Housing Rights Committee, and another as a promotora for the Mission Economic Development Agency. We provide informational resources to the Latinx community on available on available um, resources. I need to work all these hats in order for me to support my family financially. I am here to represent all the women, all the mothers, all the immigrants that have benefited from the path of these bills. And thank you for the leadership of Ms. Pelosi. I have benefited myself. During the pandemic, my son and I were very impacted. My child, child care center closed. My business has been down. And my mental health was very compromised. I have a child care subsidy, but still didn't have a place to put my son. So we needed to shelter in, at home for five months until I was able to find a place for him and I can go back to work. My son goes to a family center child care provider for four days. But he cannot go for full five days. I don't have a space for him to go to that extra day. So he stays with me and he works with me. I also use the license extend care, which is a friend when I have to work late or weekends, and I pay her out of pocket. The stimulus funds were a blessing. They helped me pay my electricity, cable, and phone bills. The 14,000 stimulus has helped us avoid further credit damage and credit card debt. The stimulus fund helped me catch up on finance to avoid financial ruin and more stress during these hard times. I am now very hopeful and excited for the child tax credit assistance because it will be ongoing support. It will, remain, it will mean stability for my family and less worry for me to focus on different goals. I want to achieve for my future and my son as well. This fall, my son will be starting school, and I am so grateful that I will be getting this cash support with, for school supplies and other basic needs. So while in the past, I was a victim of domestic violence, and I am a survivor now. Because of the policies, because of this new family plan that we are um, starting, women like me, mothers like me are thriving. The recent American Rescue Plan dollars will ensure that I do not have to pay for childcare co-payments. I need that money for basic needs. I don't have that extra money to be paying for childcare. This also will provide support to childcare providers. They need to be earning dignity wages. My son loves his caregiver, but she's not getting compensated as she should. This also American plan will, will benefit mothers, will also help us to, to, um, to support mothers that are on the wait list. There's more than 5,000 kids on the wait list that they cannot have access to childcare. Early learning is one of the most important learning that the kids need. We also need to continue fight for policies that empower women to overcome the barriers that prevent us from achieving our goals, dreams, to make our families healthier and stronger. I know what it is to be on that wait list. I was on, a wait, on that wait list when I was on my second trimester pregnant. And for me, that is unacceptable. Mothers should not go through that. That was a very stressful situation. Childcare for me 
doesn't just mean a, a place for my son to go while I'm working. It means that he's in a safe place learning and getting the adequate education that he needs to be successful in life. So on behalf of all the women, mothers out there who aren't here or even don't know that the work that Ms. Pelosi has been putting on, I wanna say thank you. Thank you. Childcare means much more than just the space. It means the future for my son, for me to continue thriving while, and let's all say, while children learning, parents are earning. Come on, everybody. While children learning, parents are earning. Children learning, parents earning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. Our next San Francisco resident has served our labor movement for over three decades. First as a Macy's retail worker with UFCW. When her companion Lester suffered an aneurysm, she became one of our esteemed IHSS home care providers and a proud member of SCIU 2015. She continues to fight for worker dignity, living wages, and union benefits. Is a grateful negotiator on behalf of fellow California caregivers and is excited to help ensure President Biden's jobs plan becomes reality, providing much needed reform in the care economy. I would like to introduce Julianne Julie Fisher, IHSS provider and SCIU 2015 member. Good morning. I am Julie Fisher. And as you just heard, for more than 30 years, I was a UFCW, United Food and Commercial Worker Local 5, worker at Macy's Union Square. In 2017, my companion, Lester, this gentleman right over here, suffered a brain aneurysm. Our lives changed in an instant. When Lester woke up in the hospital, the first thing he said, nearly the first thing, is that he was committed to leaving the hospital walking. Four and a half months later, with the support of doctors and a wonderful rehab team, he did just that. At that point, I had to leave my retail job, becoming a full-time caregiver for Lester. Thankfully, through San Francisco's IHSS program, I became part of the warm and sturdy local 2015 family. Here at her caregivers. <laughs> With SEIU Local 2015, California's home care workers had the power to make our voices heard to win raises, benefits, and funding. Let me say that funding for home care programs together. SEIU 2015 helps home care workers to keep fighting for the respect, protection, and pay that they deserve. Our long-term care system is not working, and health care disparities have been made more obvious during COVID. With the efforts of SEIU 2015 and the San Francisco Living Wage Coalition and other local unions, SFIHSS providers now earn $17.50 an hour. Many of my sisters and brothers across the country earn less than $10 an hour for exactly the same work. And they do not have benefits. They do not have paid sick leave. And many do not have the right to join a union. Home care workers are essential, skilled, and dedicated health care workers. Nearly 90% of home care workers are women. More than half are people of color. One third are immigrants. We've all seen that the racist and sexist narratives label our jobs as unskilled women's work. That is not right. 
and cannot continue. Now, with the leadership and support of the Biden administration and lawmakers like Speaker Pelosi, home care workers and our clients are finally being seen and heard. A plan to make the long overdue investment in caregiving is absolutely essential to building back better and creating an economy that works for everyone. The numbers of those who need care keep growing. Our senior population and those living with disabilities like Lester deserve to live with dignity. Caregivers need to be respected, protected, and paid. It is time to put care first. Thank you. suggestions again are a model to the nation this is where our ideas spring from it isn't a this is what it should be coming from above it's this is the experience that people are having this is what we need to address and just to, to speak to, to we'll take a couple questions but when Maria talked about not having a place I just wanted I, I looked at my cards because I didn't say this one thing before uh, that there is 25 billion dollars in the Biden plan for infrastructure because people, uh, facilities need to be and, and that was an important uh, part of it. We want obviously to have the, uh, recognize the need, have the training and respect for the workforce and the good pay, but also invest $25 billion in child care infrastructure to rebuild facilities and increase, uh, to increase the supply of care. And then another point that both Julie and Maria have made is that when we talk about building back better, we're talking about building back better with women. Because many of the people who are women, and many of them are women in our community. And what Julie talked about, about the, the pay, Disparity, ten. No, but I, we've been having these uh, hearings over the years about having respect for our caregivers. And uh, one of our, uh, over and again, this one person would be a test would testify with us. And her, her her speech was this: I would say to the worker, to the, the employer, you don't think I'm worth this much money? Do you think your mother is? End of discussion. <laughs> End of discussion. <laughs> so it is a, what we're doing here today is part of our our big week of uh, of action for care. Our care week of action. Now we've had days on child care days, on post office days, on every as, for many aspects of it. Today is this is a week. Yesterday, Jackie Spear had at my uh, colleague who co represents San Francisco. She had an event with children. I know the children will be flooding this place on Monday, respecting their privacy. We're here today. But I also want to say that across the country, there is a drumbeat for the care economy because members are having these kinds of events so that the public will be aware of what is in the bill. Not that we can just take credit for it. It's important for them to know where it all came from, but more important is that for people who know what the opportunities are so they avail themselves of it, whether it's a child tax credit or anything else. If people don't know, they may not, again, benefit from it. So it's all about making it better uh, for everyone. We're very excited about it. Really, the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris was something that was such a breakthrough for us to win the Senate so that we could, because we passed all these things last year, but now we can go bigger and get it signed by the President of the United States. Any questions on this subject? Let's hear it for the President of the United States. Any questions? 
Off topic. Uh, is, do you have any further, should any further action be taken against Representative Omar for her comments? And no. Are, are you concerned no, about the divide it, it, no. it may cause? No, I don't. I think that she clarified her remarks, and that was, uh, uh, we accept that, and uh, she, she, she has a point that she wanted to make, and she has a right to make that point. Uh, there was some unease about how it was interpreted. She made her clarification. No question? Madam Speaker, we're set to uh, open California on Tuesday as far as COVID yes. restrictions. We'd love to get your thoughts as a San Francisco resident and someone who also goes to D.C., very different places. What are your thoughts on what, what's happening here? Well, you're very smart to as do to recognize the differences because the decisions as to how you open up relate to the in incidence of the infection in different places. And hopefully, uh, San Francisco, excuse me, San Francisco has been a model to the nation. I'm so proud of Mayor Breed. She is a fabulous, fabulous job. I'm proud that there's uh, the knowledge and chair of the Health uh, Commission of the board. So, we have our finger on this pulse of minute by second by second. So, again, it, it, it's a big state, a big and glorious diverse state, different regions may interpret it differently, uh, but I'm very proud of the work that was done here. And uh, it is, again, to mask, not to mask, but vaccine, that's a large issue to this. This president has, one of the things that was a big fight for us before, and it was, you don't want to be a fear monger and say only you knew how bad this is, but it was bad because what we were trying to say is, as has been indicated, there have been, uh, our, our healthcare system has not addressed the needs of everyone in an equitable way. And this became very conspicuous with a pandemic. So we were insisting, Barbara Lee, our chair, uh, uh, Karen Bass was chair of the Black Caucus now, was being, insisting that we have specific language in the legislation about testing, tracing, treating, so that we could reach all of the communities. All that with language and cultural appropriateness, we've talked about this, Richard, would be appropriate so that people could really benefit from this. And now with the vaccine, even more so, so that the outreach uh, uh, is, is culturally and linguistically appropriate. And in our community, we have many nonprofit organizations who do that all the time. So we wanted the funds to flow in a way that recognized uh, that need and opportunity and actual uh, success with many more people being vaccinated. We haven't reached everyone. Some people still have reluctance. But we have made a, there has been a big difference made because of the resources that were put there and the um, insistence that the president has that everybody be vaccinated. So that takes us to the place that we are, a place of opening up more. Now people just have to make their judgment. If someone isn't vaccinated, they should still continue to wear a mask. That's what our uh, physician, uh, House Physic, uh, no, it's the Capitol Physic, House and Senate physician, that if you aren't vaccinated, you must wear a mask. Some of it depends on the honor system of people just being fair to those around them. So again, people will have to make their personal decision as to how they participate, uh, but it is a, quite a glorious thing that the state will be opening up more and that uh, children will be able to participate in a better way. Our goal in the rescue package was vaccines in the arms, money in the pockets, children back in school, and workers back on the jobs in a safe, in a safe Okay, so what we want to do is to have this drumbeat across America. 
Because what we're doing is crossing a threshold. We're saying we don't have home care workers, child care, family and medical leave, raising the minimum wage, equal pay for equal work. All of these things are essential for us to treat people with the respect that their work is. And as the SEIU and others, and I worked with the SIU in the Fight for 15, of course, we've been fighting so long for Fight for 15, and we want it to be higher now. <laughs> but but all, all of this is about respecting the dignity of work. So I want people to be unabashedly out there saying, this is what we need to do. Something different. Something different. And that's why I'm going to the statement to build back better. That doesn't just mean, and it's a big important thing for many of us, is to build back greener. That's better, to build back greener but also to build back with many more people participating in that building back and the economic success and prosperity of our country. Not only for jobs, that's really important, but for ownership, for businesses. Small businesses, women-owned business, minority-owned business, veterans-owned business, all those kinds of things to have some of the contracts of that go into that because you know why? It will make it better. Yeah, Make it you. better. So yes. thank you for being part of the Care Economy Week of Action.